On December 31, 2001, Microsoft ended the support for Windows 95. Many features have since become key components of the Microsoft Windows operating system. The Start menu and the Taskbar originated in Windows 95. In today's video, I am going to create a set of retail Windows 95 diskettes and install it on a Pentium 200 having 64 MB of memory. The twist of the story will be that my permanent storage solution will be limited to a Seagate ST157A, a hard drive with a maximum physical capacity of 44 MB. The fact that this drive suffers from a few bad sectors doesn't improve the condition of today's experiment. The retail version of Windows 95 with build number 4.00.950 was also available on 13 floppy disks. I already made a whole video about how Microsoft increased the space of the floppy disks they used to distribute Windows 95 from the standard 1.44 MB to around 1.68 MB. The short answer is that Microsoft crammed 21 instead of the standard 18 sectors per track on their floppy disks. If you're interested to hear the detailed explanation, then I recommend watching the other video as well. Before we can copy the images to the floppies, we need to format the majority of the diskettes in DMF, the acronym for Distribution Media Format, which, apart from other space optimizations, formats a floppy disk with 21 sectors per track. This increase in sectors is also the reason why I cannot use any of my GoTek floppy emulators, because they simply do not support more than 18 sectors per simulated track. High density diskettes, on the other hand, have a maximum capacity of 2 MB when they are unformatted. Tools like 2M get really close to unlock the maximum space of those diskettes, but the drawback is that they require drivers or other software to access them. The first two diskettes of Windows 95, the boot and the first installation disk, require space for a standard 1.44 MB image. Those two disks can be formatted using the format utility that is shipped with MS-DOS. For the remaining 12 disks, I need to use a tool like FDFormat to be able to format the disks in DMF. Only then can I use my image writing utility to copy disk image 2 to 13 to the remaining floppy disks. The entire process took me about 45 minutes to complete, because I had to first format each diskette and then write the image to it. Good that I labeled the disks before I started. Later versions of Windows 95 require 26 diskettes. But since my hard drive is limited to a capacity of around 44 MB, I'd rather try the low discount operating system first. I actually do not believe that the drive will have enough space for Windows 95. With a boot disk in the floppy drive, we can start the installation. We get right into the setup screens. And we are greeted with a non-scary information screen that informs us that we are low on disk space. Based on this information, I should not be able to install Windows 95 on this hard drive. The compact installation seems to need at least 49 MB of space but at the same time it mentions that those numbers are approximations. Well, let's see if we can continue the installation process. So far, everything is looking good, and we are prompted to insert disk number 2. And after a while, we get the setup options screen to choose from the features and programs we want to install additionally. The custom installation option is immediately followed by a low disk space warning, but when choosing compact, this screen does no longer appear. We can continue to enter our identification key and the setup process continues. Later we are even allowed to pick from a list of optional components. But I'm afraid we won't have space for any of this. Hehe, <laughs> look at the space available on the disk, just shy of 44 MB. And Windows 95 requires almost 43 MB without any optional components. Hmm, what could we possibly install utilizing this last MB that is available on this hard drive? I'm thinking the drive compression tools. Those could provide the help this drive needs. Mm, it requires 1.3 MB because it depends on the defrag application. Okay, fine. Let's not install any optional features and continue the setup process. The fate of this Windows 95 installation seems to be that there won't be space for anything but the operating system. The remaining installation was unspectacular. The process was just interrupted by the occasional prompt to insert the next installation disk. And after a few restarts, we are greeted with a Windows 95 start screen. And we finally arrived on the Windows 95 desktop. There are no graphic card drivers installed yet. Well, I probably should forget about this anyway, because with just a few kilobytes left, there is not enough space to install a graphic card driver, right? 
Um, okay, so I do have about a third of the total space left on this drive. That is interesting considering that the setup process told me otherwise. I already prepared myself to not have space for anything. And now, there is enough space to install some of the optional components. From the 42.5 megabytes that are displayed in the File Explorer properties window, only 28.6 megabytes are used by Windows, leaving me with 13.9 megabytes of free space. That is a bit unfortunate because I'm no longer in dire need of drive space. Of course, this won't be enough to install an office package or leave you with enough space to store your personal data. But hey, Windows 95 was successfully installed and is running from this hard drive. Let's format drive C and start over, this time using drive space to compress the disk and hopefully be able to get some extra space on this hard drive. Before we can use drive space, I need to install MS-DOS 6.22. Drive space is part of this operating system. Initially called double space, Microsoft released the disk compression software in MS-DOS 6.0. With MS-DOS 6.2, an improved version of double space was released but was removed in MS-DOS 6.21 due to patent infringement from Microsoft against Stack Electronics, the creator of a competing product called Stacker. In MS-DOS 6.22, a re-implemented version of DoubleSpace, now called DriveSpace, was released. And as you can see, the DriveSpace files are available in the DOS directory. All we need to do now is to run DriveSpace and follow the instructions on the screen. First, you need to decide if you want to use the Express or the custom setup. I want to see a few configuration details and therefore I'm going to use the custom setup. Next, we are asked if we want to compress an existing drive or if we want to create a new drive utilizing the empty space on our hard drive. I want to compress the existing drive to maximize the available space for Windows 95. In this case, we will also compress the MS-DOS files currently on this drive. The final setup screen allows us to change the value of how much uncompressed space should be available on the host drive. This uncompressed space will hold the initial boot files and the driver for drive space to access the compressed drive. The predefined value of 2 MB should be good enough for our use case. And after a final confirmation, drive space is going to prepare our disk. But before any files are compressed, ScanDisk scans the surface for bad sectors. And after a restart, drive space starts to compress the files on the disk. You may have seen it during the setup process. But from now on, the Seagate drive can be accessed using the drive letter H, which stands for host. On this drive, a large file will be created which contains the compressed content. This large file is then mapped as drive C. Whenever data is written to drive C, drive space will compress it automatically and store it in the large file located on drive H. Essentially, both drive letters point to the same physical hard drive, but drive letter H points to the uncompressed drive while drive letter C points to the file containing the compressed content on the same hard drive. As a final step, DOS defrag optimizes our drive. What we can see here is still the uncompressed or the physical drive, the last time we access it with a drive letter C. Next time we reboot, this drive will be accessible using drive letter H. Why am I so sure about that? Well, I can still see the bad sectors, which won't be visible once we access the compressed volume. And after a reboot, everything seems… normal. Did we really boot from the compressed drive? Under drive C, we see the MS-DOS installation. But look at the space available on drive C. Before using drive space, we only had about 44 million bytes of total capacity. And now, we have a bit over 74 million bytes available. Our hard drive, which only has 44 megabytes of physical space, can store now around 72 megabytes. That is an increase of about 65% extra. This should now be enough space for a Windows 95 installation, including some of the optional programs. I'll spare you from another setup process of Windows 95. The only difference from the first installation is that the setup process does no longer inform us that we are low on space on our hard drive. We can also see that the available disk space is now 74 megabytes. So we could definitely select a few extra features that are going to be installed during the setup process. And once we're back in Windows, we can see drive C and H. There will be an option to hide drive H, because you really shouldn't change anything on this drive. 
we can hide this drive using the drive space application found under system tools. And here we see a few more statistics about our compressed drive. It looks like our compression ratio is 1.7 to 1. Meaning, 1.7 MB of files written to the disk require only 1 MB of physical space. Of course, this is an estimate and depends on the files currently stored on the drive. Some files, like text files, compress very well, but others, like mp3 or video files, do not. This ratio may also change over time and is dependent on the data that is stored on the drive. So far, we have used DriveSpace in version 2, which is part of MS-DOS 6.22. There is, however, an updated version, DriveSpace 3, which can be unlocked if we install Windows 95 Plus Edition. DriveSpace 3 is a separate option when installing the add-on. The installation goes smooth and we are prompted to restart our system once all files are copied. Once we're back in Windows, we are greeted with a DriveSpace upgrade notification. We can upgrade our drive to the new DriveSpace 3 format. The notification window just opens the DriveSpace application. From there, we need to request to upgrade the drive once more. It seems that the compression algorithm of the newer version is able to free another 2 MB of extra space. And after a notice to back up your files, the upgrade process starts. Before the upgrade and after the installation of Windows 95 Plus, I check the compression ratio once more. Since we installed a few more applications, the ratio dropped from 1.7 to 1.6 and the capacity from 72 to 68 MB. I wonder now if upgrading to DriveSpace 3 is counterproductive in this case. The hard drive may just be too small and it could be that it would be better to remain with DriveSpace version 2. The upgrade process took over an hour to complete, but after it completed, we are greeted with some good news. It looks like we have gained more free space than initially calculated. In total, we should have a bit more than 21 MB of free space available from the 17.5 MB initially, that is 1.5 MB more than estimated. And in Windows, we can see that our drive is now displayed having a capacity of 87.2 MB. That is 15 MB more than the 72 MB we have seen when using DriveSpace in version 2. Now the compression ratio should be almost 2 to 1. Our Seagate hard drive with 44 MB of physical space can store an estimate of almost 88 MB. Twice its physical capacity. As mentioned before, it obviously depends on the files you store on the drive, but I was pleasantly surprised how this technology works. And I'm also surprised that we managed to double the space of our Seagate hard drive. And now it is your turn. Let me know in the comments if you have used DriveSpace or any other disk compression software back then. How was your experience? I'm looking forward to read your stories. And this is all I have for you today. Like the video and subscribe to my channel if you don't want to miss any future content. And thanks to all my Patreons who support this channel. Thanks for watching and I will see you in one of my other videos.